All right, but welcome everyone. Uh, but because it is Halloween, I decided last kind of last minute to change up it a bit. And now I'm calling it, at least for the special edition, uh, the night of the feature creatures and how to stop them. Some spooky stuff going on. Uh, so we're gonna talk about this thing, feature creatures or outcomes before features and uh, how to stop some problems. We'll see how this goes. Uh, it should be kind of add fun creative anyway. Uh, I'm John Miller, I'll be your, your presenter today. Uh, I'm gonna keep it pretty short. Uh, I'm a certified scrum trainer uh, as well as a product owner for many years and um, never had the job product manager. It wasn't a title I had, but I served definitely on teams as a product owner, uh, which is product management using Scrum. Uh, my passion though, is bringing all this stuff to the education side, the K-12 arena uh, in different ways. So I have something called Agile Classrooms, which this is all for uh, to help, um, help learning uh, learners become more agile and schools be more agile. So it's a lot of fun, but let's get into it, shall we? Ready? Ooh. All right, have you ever seen The Walking Dead? Uh, features that users never use or don't like. And you can type it in chat or talk, whatever, whatever you want. Just, you've ever seen this phenomenon before? Yes, no will suffice. Thumbs up. Yeah, you might get you might get very spooked spooked out. So you might you gotta. I should have given a warning before coming in into this session. You might not be able to sleep tonight. Uh, all right. So we don't want this to happen. This is scary stuff. Uh, so some of you, uh, we'll see how far I can stretch this theme of Halloween. It kind of starts diminishing towards the end. I couldn't think of much, but towards the end. But uh, I'll take it as far as I can go. Uh, you know, this trick or treat season, Halloween season, and you're probably contemplating. Uh, what candies you might get are trick-or-treaters. And here are some usual suspects, some things that I often see in uh, my kids' baskets. You know, Kit Kat bar, which is my, uh, my daughter's favorite, my seven-year-old's favorite, Twizzlers, and uh, these Necco wafers, right? These are common, some common things. Uh, and, you know, just like candy uh, features, uh, are very similar in the sense that not all people like the stuff you give them. And there's a, maybe something you've seen before, it's a popular uh, statistic out there about software. And 20% of software features that are developed, no one uses, or I mean, sorry, 20% of the features people develop, people like, people use it. They, they, they find it valuable and they're, they're, they're using it often. Uh, so like Kit Kat bars, like my daughter, she would take all the Kit Kats and eat them all the time if she could breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, others are infrequently used, like Twizzlers. Yeah, some kids will like them, some kids that don't. You know, it's kind of hit or miss. See if they like them, they don't like them all the time, probably. So I would, you could disagree with me. We could argue if you wanted about the candies, but I'm going to put Twizzlers in the infrequently used category. Uh, I did consult with an expert, which is my seven-year-old, by the way, so you have to fight some authority. And hardly ever, like these Necco wafers, don't buy them. It's just a complete waste. No one likes them, uh, but yet they're bought and they're in kids' baskets or carrot sticks, right? No one's going to use this stuff. Uh, so same thing with features, though, infrequently used. Sometimes it's used. Doesn't mean it's all bad. You know, I think of like a fire extinguisher uh, in my house, but hardly ever used. Still good, but my guess there's some problem here in this 50 and 30 percent range. All right, there's probably some problems here. Yeah. Uh, Bad candy, as bad as candy corn. I almost put candy corn there. So that was a, my contender. Uh, so just like features though, uh, can and candy, uh, this is what can happen, uh, which is a little sad because it's a lot of waste that's happening there. So what's the story that this data is telling us? This, you know, 20% often used, uh, 30%, what is it, if I get it right? Always, I should memorize this, 30%, I believe, and 50%, right? 30% infrequently and 50% hardly used. What's the horror story behind this? What is it telling us? If you had to pop it up into a quick sentence. I didn't know it was gonna be a Halloween theme presentation either until, until I decided to do it. 
waste, waste, time and money, uh, all those things, waste of candy. Yeah, not listening to the customers. Yeah, that's money, time, delays in getting stuff done because you're working on that versus the most valuable, uh, right? Yeah, find ways of getting rid of them, Antron. Uh, actually, it's funny, my best friend in college was named Antron. And if I'm saying your name right. Um, so yeah, exactly, all this stuff. So there's some bad stuff. And even worse, uh, if you say get these Neko candies or carrot sticks, your house might get toilet paper next year. So, you know, there's, there's some bad consequences that can happen from this. Uh, and I think some consequences here uh, from products dying or solutions dying uh, for lots of reasons. One is the more features you got, the bigger the backlogs, right? And that takes time, that takes energy, that takes time to refine and maybe promises made perhaps. Uh, and then when you have a giant backlog, by the way, you tend to think, oh, we don't have enough people to get all this done in time. So you hire more people and that creates more delays. Uh, that's one thing we, I think most of us know, uh, more people doesn't usually make it faster. Uh, and it creates more bureaucracy. The more people you got, the more scaling stuff you got to do, the more reporting, uh, different meetings you need to do to coordinate between those teams, et cetera. Uh, and then that creates over budget, waste of money and negative return on investment and uh, teams get burnt out, disconnected, feeling like they're working in a feature factory or what we're going to, I'm going to call the feature creature factory, factory here. Um, and these are not good things, right? These are undesired outcomes that we want uh, for our organizations. Uh, so we want to, I think one of the causes is this, and it's a ghost story. Ooh. And uh, that's my definition there, what a ghost story is. You can read it. We all have a Bob, by the way. We all have a Bob, the outlier, right? So just writing stuff, just guesses of what people need, and uh, but we're writing them as features without actually validating, do they really need it? How do we know we need it? they need it? And I like to say the intent to validate. So I could write a user story and say, but we don't know. We're not sure the need, the outcomes here, and I might need to go val. I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm, you don't always need to have upfront discovery to write a story, but uh, it's not something we're going to start working on uh, until we validate it or developing. So don't write ghost stories. And we're going to show you how to ghost bust some of these stories. And uh, best I could do, I couldn't think of a scary thing. Best I could come up with candy corn. But outcomes before features is the way we kind of ghost bust this. Uh, it's been uh, really powerful for me. I wish I learned it earlier. Uh, we keep hearing, I'm sure you've heard the term outcomes, you know, over outputs. Uh, I'm going to be very clear here what we mean by outcomes. We're going to get really concrete in, a, in an approach to help you with this. So outcomes before features, right? We want to know what the outcome is. Is it worth it? Uh, so it is pumpkin carving season, jack-o'-lantern time. So I'm going to share with you, I'm not going to go into detail on this next part, but it's just going to kind of set the stage of the bigger model here. Uh, from something called jobs to be done. I'm sure many of you heard this, like what's the job to be done here? Uh, here's a template I, I created to make it simpler for me and the people I coach and teach. Uh, I'm not gonna go over all the details and all these, but it's gonna set the stage for the outcome part of it next. Uh, so you can read over that. Right, and you see, I have a basic, uh, this is the job to be done, which is just think of it as like, what's the goal of the customer or the user? What are they trying to do? And the psychological jobs, emotional jobs, social jobs, or kind of think of that as the experience. How they, as they're getting their functional job done, making a jack-o'-lantern, uh, how do they want to feel? You know, how, what, what do they want to experience? How they want to liberate to other people? I like to think of that as how they want to experience their experience in making the jack-o'-lantern. And uh, there might be a certain situation they're in. So in this case, we're going to deal with young kids, and that's probably gonna, and that's going to provide uh, a certain some constraints around what we do. And one of the constraints is we don't know how to carve a pumpkin. Like kids, you know, we're not expert, uh, and the parents aren't expert pumpkin carvers. So uh, that might be a constraint we have around it. But we're going to use that. But what we're going to focus on is this, uh, and this is maybe my favorite part, and my think of frequently, infrequently. I use these outcomes all the time, even if I don't use the job to be done part of it necessarily. And we're going to go talk about you know, how do they make progress 
um, and value? How would the customer or user uh, figure out, am I, get, am I making a jack o' lantern getting my needs met in better ways? And this is what we call uh, desired outcomes. So read over that definition here, desired outcomes. Okay, so outcome is one of those words that has an outcome has many meanings and it depends who you talk to, someone will define it differently. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna use a working definition based off the jobs to be done model. So uh, this is gonna be our working definition, desired outcomes. And usually we mean customer outcomes and user outcome. Even though I can use the same stuff for internally business outcomes, I can kind of use the same process, but we're gonna here keep the frame that what is value and this is, they're getting their outcomes met and getting a job done, getting a goal achieved. So uh, to help us with this, now this is all prefaced by the way of discovery. And there's been a couple of sessions today just talking about that. And this is, you're talking to users, customers, you're observing them uh, and they're gonna, you know, and you're gonna learn to get some insights about what matters to them. And to help us with that though, to make sense of that data that we capture, uh, there's something called the job map. For those familiar with value stream maps or customer journey, it's very similar, uh, very similar concept to that, uh, except it's always from the user point of view, whoever's getting the job done and how they trying to get the job done regardless of the solution, regardless of what solution. So we're, we're not talking about solutions here. We're just talking about, I'm trying to make, make a jack-o'-lantern with my kids. Uh, we don't know what, we don't know how to do it very well. And uh, what are the steps we would take to get that job done? So we're just gonna map out the job here. And usually we're gonna start out with the high level uh, where the big steps they take to map out. So think of this as a customer value stream, perhaps. First, they might locate and gather resources, you know, find the pumpkin, get information about how to carve a pumpkin, all that stuff. Choose a design for the pumpkin or select one, uh, carve it, carve the pumpkin, clean up and then set up and display and show off to your neighbors, et cetera. So high level kind of values, <laughs> exactly. You'll see where be careful come, with the knife comes into play. Um, and my, my mother-in-law, by the way, she cuts everything, I know it's not carving, but she cuts everything like this towards her wrist and it freaks me out all the time. Like, Ooh. but anyway, basic kind of map of the job here, solutions agnostic, uh, just what are the basic steps that we can figure out what the solutions might be. Uh, so I'm going to give you a couple here to kind of lay out the land. And you might have a bunch of these, a bunch more than I'm going to show. But uh, I like to think of these almost as, I'm sure many of you heard that your term, you know, key performance indicator. And when I usually ask people, what are your KPIs or, you know, how do you, what are your metrics for success? I usually get things like either things that don't help me design the product, like customer satisfaction. Yeah, that's great. But that's a, that's a lagging indicator. It's not an input right? And doesn't help me measure progress and how well we're adding value. Uh, find indicator, but for a different purpose. Or I get business metrics, the number of subscribers we get or the number of users. But again, none of those help me. Those are business metrics. Those are business outcomes, not a customer, not what value means to a customer. And these are very specific phrases uh, of what is valuable to me in that step. So I'm trying to locate, gather resources. Here are the things that I care about. Um, so I'll go through a couple of these. I won't read through each one, but There we go. There's errands, right? And they might not, they're not going to come out and say, I want to decrease the risk of injury while carving a, a pumpkin. Uh, they're going to say, oh, it really freaks me out when I give my kid a knife. And you're like, oh, so would you say, you know, decreasing the risk of injury while carving uh, is important to you? Yeah, that's really important to me. So they're not going to come out and say this, or you might observe something and be like, man, they seem to be really struggling, spending a lot of time trying to find a pumpkin design. Uh, and then you write those in these, uh, what we call outcome statements, desired outcome statements. So you see some more up here. Right, so you see we're mapping out the job and then we're kind of, some people like the word pain gain points. I don't, I, I, I like outcomes, it's a little bit clearer to me, uh, is what are the outcome they're trying to do in getting the job met and how would they measure it, all right? These are, you could actually put metrics here if you wanted to and measure uh, how well they're doing it today uh, what, what that looks like. And as you uh, 
trying to satisfy that outcome over time, you know, did you make a, an improvement in any of these areas? Yeah, it does sound like a user story, doesn't it? You know, we'll get to that. It's beginning to sound a bit like a user story, right? So anyway, we map out the job and we say, here are the outcomes that uh, a particular segments, in this case, uh, you know, a family uh, that, you know, with young kids would have little knowledge. Um, there we go. And you'll see one here where I've mapped all the way throughout. Um, oops, that one. I did a search and replace at some point where I did, I meant to do it in one slide and I deleted all the increases. So this should increase likelihood kids. I missed that one. Increase likelihood kids can execute the design with minimal help. And that's going to be across multiple steps, right? Probably pretty important is my guess. But now we have a basic sense of now, this is what value means to a customer. And this is why I love this model is I've, I rarely, I'm not seeing there's not other models, but for me, it pro provides crystal clear clarity about what value actually means versus just saying the value word, which is like saying Smurf, uh, I find. It's like, oh, let's deliver value. It's like saying, well, uh, let's Smurf that. Like, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, but I love the clarity. Like, when we're talking about value, what value are we talking about? So what did you notice about these outcome statements? Uh, someone said, and it starts to sound a little bit like a user story, almost. One could define it that way, I guess, but uh, what else did you notice? I'll go back so you can see it, it'll be better. Yeah, what do you notice about these outcome statements? Anything in common, concise, change of state. Yep, there's a change of state. There's a direction. Uh, actually, Simon put that in. I, I knew Simon pretty well. And uh, he has this idea, of, if I got it right, a vector. You know, uh, vector is value. And these are really vectors of what, you know, the direction for value. I'm sure I butchered his thing, so. Yeah, and these are measurable. You can actually put numbers in here if you wanted to. This might be good enough, but you might see right now it takes them five hours to just to uh, you know figure out which pumpkin carving design idea to choose, right? And we're going to move it down to two hours, right? But maybe incrementally, we're do four hours, three hours, etc. But yeah, all those things. KPIs and measure success. This is why I love this so much. Um, so. This is Ecto-1, I couldn't quite get it to show out right, but uh, the Ghostbuster vehicle, that's my theme. But here are some other attributes here, some of the things that you talked about. These aren't business outcomes. We want to be able to, you know, you could put the same kind of statement for that, but these are very customer user focused, hence value focused, right? What do we, what is, what does it mean for a customer to drive value? Uh, solutions agnostic. If you notice here, what I mean by that is we're not talking about solutions or features. We're not talking about how they're going to get the job done, what we're going to do to help them get the job done. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a second. But when you look at these, this doesn't say we're going to give them an app to help them design ideas. We're gonna give them a stencil. Uh, we're gonna do whatever. It, that, leaves, that leaves that open. So uh, there is no, um, there's no solution here yet, right? Based you know, at, at this point. As Joseph Kettering once said, a problem well-defined is a problem half solved. And this is a big part of product ownership is defining the problem. And I think this does it really well. Hopefully that suffices, Gary. It's a weird word, I know. Oops. I think I have a typo here, which I meant to fix. But anyway, I'll say it out loud. Uh, so really, it's just a set of needs. It's a web of needs, and I used the had to use the web for the Halloween thing. Uh, but each has a specific importance and satisfaction level, uh, according to the user or the customer. Uh, so they'll say this need is really important. This you know increased likelihood of that you know my kids stay safe while cutting is going to be super important. How satisfied am I today? Maybe not very satisfied. Uh, and that really scares me. I don't have a solution that unless, unless I cut it for them, which I'm not happy with because I want them to do it. Uh, and we might say that's an unmet need, 
And that might be what we also would call an opportunity. That's an opportunity for us to go after. Uh, but you'll see this laid out, right? And, and you can measure these things in, in different ways uh, to get your importance level and your satisfaction level. In a way you're kind of, you're not really prioritizing the outcomes, but you are categorizing them based on these two, these two vectors, importance and, and how satisfied am I today in getting the outcome met. Uh, if it's not important or not very satisfied or, and I'm very satisfied, probably don't care. Like, I don't, I'm not gonna jump to your product uh, because that's a need already have met. I'm not worried about that one. But the cutting part with my kids, if you can offer a solution, that might be a great value proposition that might help me jump over. So there is a formula you can use, uh, just like user stories, there's a template uh, and uh, that you could use. And here's one I have uh, a little desired outcome card. And if you want to kind of track these things, you could do like, what's the job to be done? And what's the job step that is in? So choose the design, but what's the direction, right? I, you know, there's a direction improvement we're trying to make. And is it increase, decrease is what I like to use to kick that off. There's other ways, minimize, maximize. Uh, the metric for the customer. So in this case, it's the number of, but it could be the number of steps. It could be time. It could be the current level of knowledge. It could even be behaviors, right? Uh, but in this case, increase the number of creative design ideas. So what do we want to improve? And then if you need to, not always, but you might do a contextual clarifier. Oh, when carving pumpkins with young kids, perhaps. Uh, there might be some context there or constraints uh, in place that, that you might want to include because that's going to inform your solution. Right, so basic format for a desired outcome, uh, which I find quite helpful. So let's check out. Oh, okay, I added this, this today because I saw something on Twitter and I was like, okay, this is, I had to use it. So are you ready for something really scary? We'll see if this works out. Uh, are you ready for something really scary? All right. Is talking on the phone getting out of hand? Look out! You need phone relief. The ultimate in hands-free phone design. Watch. Simply attach the special double back fastener to any phone. Then attach the phone relief headset. It's that easy. Hands-free, pain-free. You'll wonder how you ever lived without it. It's perfect for remotes. Now talk hands-free anywhere, anytime. Office work is a pain for Mr. Phone in the Neck, but you won't miss a beat with hands-free freedom. A must for the entire office. Work goes quicker and easier. The padded headset removes moves this easily and is fully adjustable. Best of all, Phone Relief works with your favorite phone, an amazing breakthrough product you'll use every day. Now only $12.95. Call toll-free to order by credit card and make this your last phone of the neck call. <laughs> so uh, I remember that. I looked at it, I was like, I remember that being on the commercials. I remember watching that in 93. So, um, so I just thought it was funny. So I, I got to use this somehow. So here we go. Uh, think about that video. The uh, was it? Phone relief, I think it was called. Um, what's, what's some outcomes that maybe that product is so, so, uh, solving for? You can write it, just think it if you want, or write it down privately, or you can write it down in chat and think about using this format, uh, you know, direction, um, the customer metric, and what to improve, at least those three things. So increase or decrease something. Yeah, so uh, increase my ability to multitask while having a call. Uh, decrease the pain in my neck. Uh, I, I don't quite understand. It seems like it would hurt more, but yeah, there we go. Nicole's nailed it, right? That's a, that's a perfect outcome statement, right? Uh, even a contextual clarifier there. Nicole nailed that one. Right, so that's solving some outcomes and there's probably a bunch of them along the way. So here's mine, uh, which is decrease the frequency, the headset falls off, um, off my head. Uh, while doing jazzercise, because that wasn't, was that a thing in the 90s? I don't know. It just seems like it'll go well with the video. Um, increase our freedom of using both hands. Yep. So those are all some outcomes, and there's probably a bunch of those uh, that at the time, <laughs> based on the technology at the time and what was possible at the time, seemed apparently to them a breakthrough solution, a breakthrough solution. Uh, you don't want to know what jazzercise is. Don't worry about it. It's too scary even for this session. Uh, so outcomes create optionality. Number one, you don't have, it's hard to have optionality if you start with features. You paint it yourself into a corner prematurely, you prematurely converge, you, you can't pivot. 
So in this case, actually, I should have put an app, as I was saying it earlier, an app would have been a cool, actually a good solution idea here. But uh, let's say we chose to look at the outcome. Hey, this is the outcome we're going to focus on. Increase the number of creative design ideas, you know, for parents uh, and the family, right, for carving a pumpkin. And we have a couple, four options we thought about of features or, or solutions, you might say, right, those four. So it creates optionality. Uh, is that the right place? Oh yeah. And then the question becomes, which of these features out of those four increases the satisfaction of that outcome most? Uh, and there's probably some other things to worry about costs and feasibility. Uh, but the, the other part of that part is how important is it? And we've se selected it because it was important. Now we're saying, which one of these is gonna increase that satisfaction level based on that outcome statement? So based on increase not, to increase the number of creative design ideas, uh, what's going to be the best way of you know, doing that um, based on whatever, you know, whatever is possible today for us. Uh, so, you know, these are things we learn. We might roll out some of these, or maybe we did a prototype and we learned it didn't work, feasi you know, feasibility wise. Uh, we, the printed stencils cost too much money maybe to ship out. Uh, you know, we want it to be more digital, perhaps we decide to go that route and, oh, you know, having a downloadable printable stencil designs is going to do that. And then we can always add more, have community driven ones as well over time. That's really going to increase the number of ideas. So we think that's the best solution. And if you're wrong, of course, we could always pivot, right, um, to, to something else. Or if it's not possible for some reason, it could be, you know what, we're running out of time. And we got to get something out the door. So let's just give them some prompts. So maybe we pivot over to the prompts, but at least we talked about those and we have those available to pivot to. Uh, so optionality, optionality enables agility. Right? There's, I, I really don't think there's any agility unless you have options that you can pivot to something else. And this makes it easier. This makes it better. And you're, you're pivoting on the outcome level uh, at this point. So on the outcome, you're keeping, just like when you pivot, when you dance or doing martial arts or whatever, you need to have something stable for you to pivot on. In this case, it's the outcome. It allows you to be flexible with the features, the solutions. So our ghost stories, and this is a way of helping to minimize the number of ghost stories we have in our product backlog is to start with outcomes as much as we can. So let's take a look at this though. Let's see how this can kind of come in, into play. Uh, so someone says it looks a lot like a user story. And this is one way, it could be high, high, big high level and you might break that down to even smaller outcomes, but you can see where we have two thirds of the user story already created, but we didn't talk about the features yet. And then we selected it. And then we have a user story, at least the template, the common template we use. But we do that here after we know our outcome. And that increases the chance that this is, thing is actually valuable. That's actually needed. Right. And it makes it so much easier when you're, if you're using this format uh, to write them or, and, and actually have something that isn't made up. Is that, I don't know if anyone else here has seen that, but you have user and you, you kind of make up the so that you already have the feature idea, then you kind of, you, you find the problem, right? That, that match that you feel like would justify the feature idea that you want to have. So, starting with outcomes, start with the problem, et cetera. Same you know, universal principles, right? Timeless principles here, but we tend to forget. So what do you think some of the benefits here might be uh, of using these? Yeah, what do you think some of the benefits might be I'm using these outcome statements, starting with outcomes before features? Yeah, bullet points going forever. The way I'm interpreting that, Chris, is uh, we're just throwing everything in there to justify it versus being very clear, right? Uh, about what problem are we solving for? Yeah, I think uh, all those things are true. Um, it powers the team. 
I think it's something any stakeholder can understand, any executive can understand that getting into the weeds of what you're doing. Hey, this is the problem we're solving right now, increasing the number of uh, creative uh, jack-o'-lantern ideas. People get that pretty easily. <laughs> That's right. Especially with inflation right now, Nicole, the candy prices are going up 15% this year is what I read. So even more important today. Yeah, just not cool, but they're measurable. They're the things we, we validated or we could validate. You know, again, I think you could write the story and be like, we think this is the outcome, but we need to go validate this. But here's a placeholder for us to have that. What a user story really is, is a conversation between customers, users uh, about their needs. Uh, so absolutely, 15%. So here are some uh, outcomes from using outcomes that you might see. And see my increases, decreases there. Let's take a look at those. It kind of matches what some of you all wrote. Sorry to disappoint. I couldn't think of a Halloween thing for this. So I failed. That's okay. Some of the things listed here are kind of scary. <laughs> Such as? Um, the car. Uh... Promiscuous pivoting. That I gotta look that one up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd say that. Has anyone seen that before? Oh, we're agile. We'll just keep pivoting, and it's a little bit like uh, exactly. It's a little bit like, hey, we have a bunch of arrows we're gonna shoot, and maybe we'll hit something. <laughs> and you know, I see a lot of agile teams unfortunately kind of use agile as an excuse to not know what their target is, right? And of course, you can pivot your outcomes too, but I see way too much of that and. Yeah. Was pivoting. I got, if I had redid this again, for, unfortunately, I can't reuse this until next Halloween, but do it again. Yeah. I like that. Like what, what in this list might scare you, right? Uh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and these would be, you know, uh, at least a, a minimum uh, hypothesis, uh, something you could do with the outcome is use that as your hypothesis. We believe this will increase uh, the number of creative design ideas they will use with their, with their kids. And it's something you could validate. All right, so, I, and there's a lot more actually, I just, couldn't fill it up. I could think of a bunch more um, outcomes here. But I think just these are well worth it uh, to kind of take a shift on what is the outcome uh, that we're having. I think it solves a lot of pain points that I see in a lot of organizations. And I think these are product metrics. These are great product level metrics that you can report out on, socialize, have conversations about things that actually matter you know, uh, versus a bunch of, you know, metrics that I see out there, unfortunately, vanity metrics uh, that you might see or corporate bat, corporate jumbo mumbo stuff that you might see out there, which really don't really make a difference. And by shifting this, some of this, when you heard the term, the feature factory, you know, John Cutler created or, uh, you know, Melissa Perry's escaping the build trap. And they both have great, you know, ways of helping you through that. I think this is one lever you can use to escape that feature factory mentality, or in this case, our Halloween version, the creature feature factory uh, along the way. Uh, you're not just cranking out features. You have something to validate it against. Uh, just like you have acceptance criteria for a user story, uh, I like to think of uh, outcome statement as a selection criteria for does it even make it, in, does a feature even make it to our product backlog? Right, it's a gatekeeper of like, okay, does it meet an outcome? And how much so based on other options? Does it, and if it doesn't, it doesn't even come in. Uh, and two, as impact criteria of after we, you know, after we put something out there, did it really make a difference? You know, and we can actually measure that, talk to customers or use the analytics, whatever it might be to help us with that. So user story, the acceptance criteria, very similar, but at the beginning before coming to the backlog and at the end, right? Kind of really 
flows, you know, has a much bigger picture uh, than you would with just acceptance criteria. Uh, here are some ways you could use it. There's more, much more ways. Uh, I actually could map out the whole job of a product owner or a scrum team and talk about where outcomes could probably fit into that. But here are some easy ways perhaps, uh, or easier ways to start with using outcomes that you might use if you're in a scrum team anyway. So I, I like them for sprint goals. Uh, uh, I think if, and you might have something smaller. So for example, um, many, some of you might be familiar with that like Nordstrom Innovation Lab video uh, that they do with the sunglasses and the app. So I think of that one a lot, which is, oh, they're, they're sprint. Uh, they were intending to decrease the time to select a pair of sunglasses and all their you know, features and user stories they brought in uh, to, that, to their week uh, was all made for that sprint goal. So it's a really good candidate for framing a sprint goal to make sure it actually something that makes an impact uh, to a customer or user. Um, release goals, it's perfect for release level goals as well. Hey, we're trying, this is the set of features that is gonna help us to drive these outcomes, right? To make progress on these particular outcomes. And road mapping, I love, I personally love this about roadmaps. Uh, I think many people uh, are very familiar with feature driven roadmaps. You take your backlog and you pretty, or epics or whatever, and you chop it up and you lay it out over four, you know, the next four quarters. Uh, and again, that's premature convergence. You're solutioning too early. There's too much uncertainty, too much change, so much waste, other stuff going on. And by having it at a higher level, you can kind of, you know, uh, you know, give your roadmap a promotion through outcomes. You can have them reach a higher level and give you some adaptability and optionality and not prematurely converge uh, along the way. Those outcome statements, I usually can think a little bit more, more far out than I can features. Or use both, right? You can use both of them to at least connect the bigger picture of what you're doing. Uh, and go on and on with different ways of using outcomes. But here's three things I think uh, you might start shifting to. Uh, that you could probably easily do with the, with the Scrum team today using these outcome statements. So how might you, oh, we're actually towards the end already. Uh, so how might you use these desired outcomes uh, at work in some way? And remember, if you're not in, I'm guessing most people here in technology software, but if you're not, this stuff applies to anything. It's not anything to do with software. Uh, nothing to do with technology. Uh, it could be designing a physical product. It could be developing a service. So those outcomes uh, statements are, are universal uh, across domains. So, but what might you do based on what we learned here or what you got a glimpse of when you get back to work? Yeah, oh, thanks, Nicole. I never would have thought of that without Halloween. So I saw the spider web. Like, hmm, how could I use that? Yeah, what I love about the job map, Molly, is you're already probably familiar with that thing. If you, I know you've done value stream mapping and those type of things before. Uh, so it's already something you already know how to do. It's just a different shift in perspective. <laughs> that is true, Matthew. It was a desired outcome. Molly. Did it work? How was the Halloween theme? Did it, did it totally blow up on my face? Could have.
Oops. And I do have some templates for you. <laughs> Get to work, Aaron. You got to carve those pumpkins. Then it's time. Just like you got to carve out your product backlog. Because some of those are rotting. I'm always like, oh, John, John, John. Uh, all right. Yeah, that's pretty bad. All right. Uh, so, uh, I don't have them uploaded yet, but I will. And to find these things, I have a bunch of templates already. I just got to get them in a spot. I use them for my classes. So um, I don't usually make them publicly val available. First time I did a presentation on this uh, outside of my classes. So um, I'll have a place for you to download a bunch of like, even that job profile that you saw earlier, the job map, the desired outcome cards and, and, and some more stuff. Uh, but some resources for you if you want to explore more than this. Uh, an excellent book. It's it's one of the best books I ever had read on product ever, and one of the most comprehensive called "What Customers Want." And I think this was done like early '90s or something uh, by Anthony Tony Alwick, who pretty much um, no, we didn't use these in our CSM class, Gary, uh, in my product owner class, though we use them. Uh, but uh, what customers want, this is just pretty much. It's everything, everything's in there. I just make it a little bit easier to use, I think, uh, make it a little bit more user-friendly, uh, but it's awesome. And there's just so much in there about how to use these outcomes and jobs, uh, everything from even what your strategy is. So I highly recommend that book. Uh, it's pretty dense, but well worth it. Um, website jobs to be done.com, which is, uh, or outcome-driven innovation is the, is the original name, but uh, end up calling it jobs to be done. Uh, my templates will be here uh for you uh so I'll, I'll copy and paste that once i minimize the slide and put it into chat for you uh but it will it will be there soon it's not there now it's empty right now uh, a landing page you could say uh or uh as a as a pretty uh obvious pitch take my product owner class even if you have a product owner uh certification i find my class is pretty different and we focus a lot on jobs all the way throughout and how to connect it all the way to backlogs and uh, into a sprint. So a very different take, I think, than, than a lot of others. But anyway, some resources and there's a bunch of other, other stuff out there that you could that you could search, fine. Uh, but let me paste that in for you. And that's me, you can find me at these places.